Welcome to I've Never Read Discworld. I've not read much Discworld. This is book seven. I'm Andrew Luke. I'm PJ Hart. I've read a significant quantity of Discworld. This will be my second go round with this particular book. Pyramids, the book of going forth, published in June 1989 by Glance. Each month we look at a Discworld novel in publishing order and PJ guides me through it um or i guide him through it yeah it's it's not my first time reading it. it it is andy's do you want to give us the blurb i think you have the book handy there the so. synopsis by blurb then being trained by the assassins guild in ankmore pork did not fit tepic for the task assigned to him by fate he inherited the throne of the desert kingdom of jelly baby rather earlier than he expected his father wasn't too happy about it either. But that was only the beginning of his problems. Pyramids, The Book of Going Forth, is the seventh Discworld novel and the most egregiously funny to date. Which is exactly what it claimed about the last one. Well, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a bold claim. If, if it's going to get funnier every time, then surely we're in for a treat. I have a feeling we might have something to say about that claim <laughs> each of yes. us <laughs> uh so how far up the pyramid can you go indeed that that is a good jumping off point maybe to just get straight into the first impressions actually it, did, did did you feel that your first impression was that you were embarking on the funniest disc world book to date um so uh it, this is divided into four books and the, the first book, it started off really well for me. I really, really enjoyed it. But as we got to book two and beyond, it, it felt like a very different story. It, now, granted, I I I was talking to you before we come on, I kind of had a hard month emotionally. Mm. So I might not as be in receptive as I might be. I kind of had this issue with Mort. Um, no, pyramids just didn't really connect with me. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, certainly my experience, not of this book in particular, but my experience of the series as a whole is that like, it's always been a bit of a comfort blanket. It's always been a bit of an emotional support series. So when I've been in the, when I've had kind of a hard time in the past, like I would reach for a Discworld book, but in fairness, like this isn't one that I would reach for. This is so this read this isn't one that I've ever reread. This was my second time ever reading it. So I totally get where you're coming from on that front, you know. Uh, although in saying that, like I did I did read this one quite early on and I think that was probably to its detriment. I think I picked it up from the library on our way out of Belfast, on the way to our caravan that we used to have in Fermanagh. So it was like if you were going to a caravan in Ireland, regardless of what time of year it is. If you have a book with you, that book is going to get read from cover to cover, regardless, because it's going to rain all the time and there's going to be yeah. nothing else to do except uh, read a book. So, Fermanagh is kind of the Northern Irish Lake District, and it's a very long, long way away. Yeah, and it, it felt longer then, you know, back in the 90s, uh, before the good roads and stuff. So, yeah, so that, that, that that's my kind of recollection is like I, I had the book and I was in the car and then I had the book and I was in the caravan. And that's how it got read because there's a lot of stuff I think that was a little bit beyond me in this book at the time when I read it when I was like 13. So interestingly, even though you didn't necessarily connect with it that much beyond the first book because my expectations were lowered and because so much of it went over my head the first time around, I got more out of it this time. Like I still wouldn't, I wouldn't like bump it up the rankings or whatever but like i definitely appreciated it more this time than i did the first time around but that's all that's all relative obviously isn't it you know? i could i could see how it would be a good holiday book i mean we, we try to keep this podcast as organic as possible but there there is a a formula a structure at work in we're recording this we're publishing it so by that standards i i don't know maybe there was more pressure on to 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 demand more of the book and it it didn't give it there's a lot of really great gags and set pieces and parts of the climax but the bones the structure of it felt 
a little too desperate and mm. fragmented. Um, yeah, but, I get that. And and you alluded to it already, I guess, the fact that it's it's broken down into like these four parts, which like structurally is a little bit of a departure. And I'm curious, since you have the book there in front of you, how does it rate page count wise? Is it longer? Um, yeah, it's 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 actually the longest of the the seven books so far. This yeah. is a Josh Kirby cover. Um, so it's three hundred and fifty page, three hundred and eighty pages long. Oh wow! Oh, yeah. Um, this is a Corgi edition published in nineteen ninety. So maybe yeah, what, first second year edition. Yeah, people are probably getting a bit weirded out that I always ask that of you because. I read it on Kindle and just depending on what time of day it is or what device I'm on, you know, my tech, the text will be different. So I don't get a really good sense of how many pages it is, but I'm as regular listeners will know, I'm a bit of a nerd when it comes to story structure. So yeah, so I'm always kind of curious now because I feel that like there's some weaknesses to the story in this, but there are some advances in his craft in terms of storytelling as well. So like, we're definitely going to get into a bit of that nerdy stuff as we go through. But I think that that probably sums up kind of my approach to the second reading of it. And I definitely find it more interesting to read it again with like with my script editor hat on or whatever, rather than I find it immersive. Then I got you know, I didn't really get immersed in the story as I would in, say, a Mort or a, a Weird Sisters. But yeah, from a craft perspective, I, I think there are some significant steps forward in terms of, you know, giving us this brand new protagonist, single protagonist in Tepic, which we haven't really seen since like Rincewind. Uh, and I also really like how he begins to experiment with twists. And we'll, we'll get to that, obviously, as we discuss the plot. Uh, and there are a few themes that a few seeds of themes, almost that I think are going to come back a bit more full voiced when we get to later books. And he's just kind of noodling with them here. He's playing with them. So I, I love all that stuff. But it, it's so hard for me to discuss it without without spoiling things for you. <laughs> things. Reading around this book, the very little I did, I get the impression this is an experimental book. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that, yeah. And I just, yeah, some of the experiments land and, and some of them don't. So might be interesting to see if we can figure out what he was trying to achieve and did and didn't. And um, and yeah, you can you can throw out a few a few hints on what worked and what didn't. So we uh, typically present a, a little bit of a synopsis to to chat around. Before you go into the first one, uh, I, I want I want it noted that Andy threw the gauntlet down to get me to try to write some of his synopses this time around, and I totally bottled it. I just ignored the message. He's like, "Do you want to write these?" And it just went no. Nah. I just I'm not even gonna I'm not even gonna justify that with a response. I'm not even gonna look him I, in the eye. There's no way I can't step up to the plate and challenge the master. I so. appreciate the confession, PJ, because a lot of people would have just uh, like lied under oath. <laughs> yeah. No, it's been eating me up. Uh, and of course, you've done you, you've done your masterful work as always. So uh, by all means, lead us into the first um, synopsis. And um, by my edition, pages one to eighty nine, the book of going forth. Tepic takes part in his final exams for the Guild of Assassins, relayed with flashbacks to leaving his home in Jelly Baby, settling a religious squabble in the boys' dorm, facing down the fearsome masters, learning guild history and etiquette. And when Tepic is called upon to kill for his final test, he chooses not to. Celebrating graduation with Arthur, jitters and alcohol, a seagull breaks up an attack with news his father, Tepa Simon the 27th has died. Meanwhile, the ghost of the late king observes First Minister and High Priest Dios prepare the funeral arrangements, and he is not happy. Tremendous as always, and especially because there's so much more going on in this book, you know, it's, it's lengthier and, and, and all the rest of it. Uh, this first one in particular, well, it's your observation now that you said, I mean, how did you feel about this first this first part i really liked it i uh felt it was well for better and for worse like a like a little novella yeah it felt separate from the rest of the book mm. but it also felt for the most part i mean if you would strip out the the jelly baby 
uh, subplots. You know, it, it and and the ending. It it yeah, it could be its own novella. I was I was mm-hmm. laughing there because I've said to PJ that I know I'm going to mispronounce Jelly Baby a dozen times. He's doing great um, so far. I'm just not going to say it. I'm just going to call it the kingdom. <laughs> I've actually my notes. It's spelled as Jelly Baby sometimes, so I don't uh, keep yourself uh, right. Yeah, it's not a, the, yeah. the only way not to lose is to is to not play the game. I think on that on that front. The, yeah, and even that actually, uh, maybe that's worth just a quick aside. The 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 wordplay, the puns, you know that the kind of old Egyptian style naming and the spelling doesn't do itself justice, obviously, in, when we're just speaking it. But obviously, if you've read the book, and hopefully you have, if you're listening along with us, do you want to, do you want to try and do you want to spell Jelly Baby out loud, Andy? D-J-E-L-I-B-E-Y-B-I. I mean, that, that, that's as obfuscated as it can get, but like, yeah. Once once it clicks and once once all that kind of wordplay clicks, it's not like it's not super intricate, but like the consistency of it and that kind of absurdity of it, like like jelly baby. <laughs> Spot <laughs> question, like, PJ. What's the river called? Oh snap! I've forgotten already. What is is it the river Jail or Dejail? Oh yeah, Jail. So all yeah, all all the um, all the opening consonants are silent, and that's why like. Sometimes in the fandom, when we talk about Terry, we spell it P Terry, like P, like Tracy, you know. Oh, this. right, right. Because so, I noticed in, in the wiki that sometimes uh, Tepic is spelt with a P. Yeah, yeah. And there's a bit we'll get to later on when um, Tracy is speaking a Phoebean, which is in the universe version of Greek. And oh, Tracy, I'm just getting that now. Hey. <laughs> but when she's speaking in a foreign language there's a lot more p's a lot more silent p's because she's speaking it with an accent i like oh, little things like that like that they get me like even when there's you know things that i'm not enjoying that much like the the wordplay is is always even if it as i said it's not overly intricate it's it's just going to get me every time i just love it so my favorite part of the book you've got action adventure compelling characters situations the core theme i think of going forth is a memorable one it's identifiable mm. magnetic i mean travel broadens the mind for all of us i think of myself going to england to university and those four years um for bad and for good are sort of emblazoned in my mind as something different something alien something wonderful mm, absolutely and, um I- I think I'm going... that really comes across in Tepic's character. And I, I, Tepic is, we, we talk about him in a, in a minute, but yeah, my favourite character in this book by far. Yeah, and I think that in terms of like what's been experimented with, in terms of creating like a completely original protagonist who isn't Rincewind and who's not Mort and who's not uh, Granny, you know, like he's already got this like growing stable of like really good protagonists. So like, to decide to formulate a brand new one for book seven feels feels quite brave, and I, and I agree. I, I do like Tepic for all the issues that I have. Mostly, I guess, with the high concept of this book, I think like the character of Tepic is strong. One thing that I, I still don't really understand. I'd be really interested to get your take on this, actually, Andy. Like, I remember being feeling quite cheated the first time I read this because I was a bit like you. I loved the the initial setting i love the guild of assassins school i love that little gang of friends that he had and you know it's all kind of framed around his final t- assassins test and the fact that he decides not to kill the victim so the final test in the assassin school as you know if you've read it is you have to kill somebody makes sense and he decides not to but then through this bizarre accident you know the crossbow bolt ricochets around the room and, and kills the guy anyway. And I always just felt that that was a bit of a cop out. Yeah, and then you were I, a bloodthirsty child. I could, <laughs> apparently I was. I mean, if you're reading this in like a rainy caravan in Fermanagh, like you want, that's what you want. Like, <laughs> yeah, he's, a, he's an assassin. Um, and I, I think that there is an author's contrivance there of 
Pratchett's approach seems to be a very universal one, which extends to 40 year olds like us and, and like 13 year olds. Pratchett seems to be quite inclusive in his intentions. So having the main protagonist murder someone, um, my, I, th I think his thinking is, uh, is going to put people off. So I think he engineers it quite well because Tepic does go through a number of mental um, mechanisms of, of reasons why not to kill, who is under the blanket. Yeah, sure. Um, could it be this, the master himself, some innocent plucked off the streets? It's and an interesting thought experiment for sure. Do you know what it is? I think just like I've just become a bit, yeah, so like I was obviously bloodthirsty <laughs> as a child, but, but now I'm cynical and like, because I'd spend a lot of time in like TV development and stuff. And like, there's a big trend, you know, for your darker, more complex heroes, I guess these days, you know, post Breaking Bad, post The Sopranos. It's just like, if this was a HBO series, like he would just straight up, he would kill the guy at the start, you know, and then it would make him this like dark, complex character. But that's like, dark. that's not terrible. So dark. Yeah, but that's not Terry Pratchett, I guess, you know, yeah. like, and he's making fun of the assassins for being like that. So, you know, he knows what he's doing. Who am I to question it? Like, I, I love the attention to etiquette. Uh, an assassin must dress a certain way, must be, um, if I'm not imagining, well-mannered, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, presumably have their cutlery all arranged, not flaunt weapons. I mean, it makes me think of... Um, well, I was possibly a poor example, a character of a Nara in in Firefly. Oh yeah, um, who's essentially a prostitute, but she's a an ambassador mm. as well, and you know, so it's it's um, it's a lot more dimensions around a a job that you know that might otherwise be looked down upon. Yeah, well, I mean, a Nara would fit in perfectly in the Assassin's Guild. From uh, yes. as we learn of it here, wouldn't she? Like so, yeah. So I get your point about how this feels really self-contained, and it's like a really, a, a really cool glimpse. Like you know, I keep going on about how like I love Ankmore Pork and I love the guild system, and I, I just always felt like such a fresh way of looking at a fantasy world to me. So I loved this like extended glimpse into the Assassin's Guild and its workings and stuff. And then certainly the first time round when I read it. I was disappointed to move away from that, but this time I was braced for it. So it wasn't, it didn't sting in the same way, I guess. I knew, I knew it was going to come to an end at the first book. So I just kind of enjoyed it a bit more for what it was, I think. We've quite a lot of characters introduced in these first um, 80, 90 pages. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm seeing, I think we're at least, at least 10 sort of major and minor characters. Um, but we're going to, we're going to, Explore those through the pod. Tepic, Merisette. I can't even remember who Merisette. Merisette's the old master, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, who I, yeah. Quite impressed me as sort of that older teacher, professor, wagging the finger. And I bet you have a specific teacher that you're picturing. Like I know I do whenever I'm reading Merisette. You know. I've definitely got some sort of connection there. Yeah. It's it kind of yeah. It's evoking something from school days gone by and same here um actually quite quite a few teachers oh, okay yeah i'm just gonna throw this out there in case um connor is listening but for me it's it's mr crummy from somalikis i think we have at least one somalikis old boy as a regular listener so i'm just gonna throw that out there for them and see if they agree we've got tepic's classmates chitter arthur Ladorum, and she's right uh, She's right, sort of the, the bullish one. Arthur's a, a sort of baby, if I remember rightly. Yeah. And uh, Chitter's kind of the best pal type who we see later in the book. And yeah, I, I, I love that sort of ensemble. Mm. And we get, this is where the set pieces really come to get, really work together. That there's there's so many of them, it feels like a, and so many tiny almost like little pieces of flash fic that all joined together. Mm. Um, it really made this guild come alive for me. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And, and 
obviously like there is a bit of a payoff later in terms of like who he meets again and stuff like that but it feels like a lot of work and a lot of setup and a lot of world building that doesn't to just have chitter basically as be the only one who pays off later in in the story so i did find that a bit odd but definitely enjoyed it a bit more for what it was this time around because i knew that that that's how it was going to be so yeah it's a strange one i would love in in the world of disc world adaptations if we ever get to do something that explores i think more park a little bit more like i would love student assassins to be yeah. involved somehow like i would love to see more of this kind of world you know i think i would cheese right turn is introduced us as a um, the bully, but later he becomes part of that core group, um, mm-hmm. and he's bullying um, Arthur, who I th- over religion because Arthur is is he a Satanist or he likes to yeah like this, or something. yeah he's doing pentagrams and stuff I love that and again so this this is one of those seeds that I was talking about I guess and in, in a way I guess if you were being kind of strict and about looking at like the themes and the motifs of this story you'd be like okay well through these characters and through these set pieces we understand a little bit more about how religion functions in the disc and that's obviously really important in terms of Tepic and Tepic's dad and their divineness or their godhood or whatever you know element of their religion that they embody and how how that functions in reality in the disc and it's all powered by belief it's basically what it comes down to and we get the first hints of that here I suppose so, so it, I mean, it, it's not without its place, but it's like, it's like at the thematic level or the tonal level, isn't it? You know. Um, you've also got the, uh, the sort of the the night after graduation or the night after their exams, and they go out on the, the town drinking, and there's a kind of yeah. um in betweeners, Malcolm in the middle kind of thing going on there. So. Yeah, the more we talk about it, the more love I have for it, for sure. And you know, every time he he writes drunk people <laughs> you know i'm there yes. i'm there for that and yeah this this feels like a particular flavor that we've all had you know after after graduation or after for me like maybe after a rap party or something like that where yeah. there's just a particular energy and he captures it so well yeah yeah and i'll tell you something else I'm, I'm i'm noticing and this is this this does have a theme at least in the second half um this was the first time I've enjoyed Ankmore Park before, but this is the first time I really gelled with it, that I got a sense of, or it's not like Terry hasn't tried to impress upon me the character of Ankmore Park before, but this is the time it it really settled into me. And that is important because I think in the parts onwards, it's as it, it's not just about Jelly Baby, it is about Ankmore Park. And we see Agmore Park in the distance that we're away from it. Yeah, that contrast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Andy's ability to talk about Jelly Baby with a straight face is really impressive, by the way. <laughs> it's like, it's Neil Don. It's like he's, talk, he's talking about like actual, you know, ancient history. I love it. Uh, so as much as as much as we love this section, we, we know we have to leave it behind. Unfortunately. Do we want we? to talk about Dios? Um, I guess. I mean, yeah. I sort of feel that when he returns home, it's it's when Dios really, Dios really becomes, because he's, yeah. We get the sense just from like, I guess a little bit from um, sorcery that Ter- Terry has a certain first minister, a certain vizier type, you know, <laughs> and we get hints of that in the first act, but that that Dios topic dynamic really comes into its own in, in this um, second part. So, OK, the Book of the Dead. Let's go for it. Pages 91 to 213 of mine, the Book of the Dead book. To Tepic returns to Jelly Baby as a new king, clashing with First Minister Dios. Architect puts a clasp, and his sons are charged with building an enormous pyramid to entomb the late king. Out of time and budget, they resort to magic and manage to duplicate the efforts of their labourers quite literally. Tepic's relationship with Dios is strained when the hand of a stonemason is cut off. Following orders to execute political prisoner, Tracy, Tepic breaks out of jail to go on a run aided by a camel. You bastard. The disc's greatest mathematician. 
Behind him, the pyramids of Jelly Baby burn and the gods make landfall. Well done. That's a lot. You nailed that. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I know I say this every time you do one of these because you do them really well, but that's a lot. You know, and it, it, my recollection of the book was that all that stuff, like a lot of the stuff in there was quite memorable to me, that that was maybe still ongoing in the second half in terms of like the definitely like the laborers duplicating themselves and all that. I sort of felt that that came a bit later, but I think your point going into this was that like it's a longer book, but it's like it's still as dense plot wise as every other Discworld book we've read so far, isn't it? I I think this is a very slow boil book. Oh, okay. okay. It seemed to me that yeah, okay, so there is a lot being built. But I guess at this point, it's maybe not super clear, actually, in this part too, like what it's all building towards. Right, because even if you're wrong, having a sense of what it's building to, so uh, going forth gave us a sense of what it's building towards, even if even if we were wrong. Um, it's it's yeah, it's so slow burn here that yeah, um, yeah okay. I, I don't really know. Yeah, that's fair. No, I, I, I do think that's fair. Like, as you say, there's, there's a lot of events, but there's no real, the stakes aren't quite as clear in this particular section. And it's, it's a long section, you know, it's a hundred guts of 150 pages. So, so that, that is totally fair. Yeah, the, I really had the feeling that it could benefit from an editor. I, 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 something I want to look into um, to try and find out about the editors of the Discord books, but I got the biography there. Uh, I ordered the a life with footnotes a couple of weeks ago but because of the technical issues i'm having with my kindle app i haven't been able to read it so if anything, if anything crops out of that i'll certainly i'll we can share we can discuss um i was trying to think what might be shaved if i was to edit this i i know i'd want to like take it down by at least a third um wow, okay. but it's kind of got a i mean we're kind of steering into the direction of talking about characters there's a kind of a uh, a sociological study going on in the or sociological narrative going on in the second part, particularly around the sort of the, a number of sets of characters: the architects, the embalmers, the priests, mm. and then the core Tepic, Dios, Tracy, um, conflicts. Yeah. I think that could be part of your issue is that because we spent the whole first section in a different place with a different cast, like it's a lot of characters to introduce. It's something that cropped up in our notes a couple of times. Just like, wow, we're going to introduce, like you said, like basically a complete society from top to bottom, like Tepix the king. And we've got priests, we've got his royal embalmers, we've got people over here building the pyramid, we've got concubines, we've got literally like a whole country's worth of people and we have to meet them all on page 90 yeah. and it's imperative for Tepic's story that we understand how that society functions because that's the society that he leads and that's just like a lot to kind of take in at, at this point of the story I guess isn't it it might just have been that this might have worked better as two books uh, one yeah, maybe. And another in um, Jelly Baby yeah maybe I always, yeah, I, that, that first instinct to be like, yeah, this is too long and it's not necessarily holding my attention the whole way through. So you want to start making cuts like in my relative, well, somewhat limited experience. Like, I, I think you can make sections of a story like this work if, if you can find a way to like introduce either some tension or some stakes or something. I just think there's too much to learn at this point for any, any kind of meaningful stakes to really be introduced. I mean, I, th I know there's like funny bits where he's like, he's trying to get his bed. He's like, he's trying to get bed ordered. <laughs> like they don't have beds in Jelly Baby. And he's just trying to get this bed. And in retrospect, it's kind of a clue as to like why this country is the way it is. Like nothing modern from the outside can penetrate it. Right, but, it's, yeah, go on. But it's a, it's a little bit tricksy. And like, I like what he's doing with like withholding information from the audience in this book, because it's not something that he's been big on before this. So I get that he's still kind of experimenting with it, but like, yeah, stuff like that doesn't really hit you until afterwards. So when you're reading it, you're feeling a little bit bogged down. This so, society is quite hard on the outside with a chewy gooey center. 
<laughs> Indeed. Uh, Ar armadillos? Is that, is that the right? Dime bar ad? Is that the reference? I was going for jelly babies. But, um, oh, um, that was much cleverer. Much um, cleverer. Moving on. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you were talking, I mean, one of the central themes here is, is the weight of tradition. Yeah. Um, and how that influences culture and therefore people and yeah. not always for the better. Dios kind of embodies that, I think. Yeah. Certainly in this section, before we kind of learn more about him, like it's... Uh, I mean, without getting like too sociological about us and our our place in the world, you know, I think like we we're, we're from a place that is steeped in tradition. That's not always for the better. It's not always to our right. our benefit, you know, and that and and people cling to tradition for for various different reasons. And certainly, I think something that's hinted at here, and that is definitely paid off later, is that. Tradition is like a tool to consolidate power for people in power. So you have all these regimented rules and you're not allowed to do this or somebody will cut your hand off or you're not allowed to do that or you'll get thrown to the crocodiles. It's just it's a way of controlling people, isn't it? Like yeah. really having to explain to them why. Yeah, what you what you just said, actually, the comparisons between where we live in Northern Ireland and, and the, the way tradition is exercised in Jelly Baby by Dios um specifically and and others um yeah i thought thought that was quite uh key um and we we could probably talk about politics and 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 use the word dios in in place because he is so set in his ways he is so inward looking and um kind of regimented and I think inward it's looking just the is the way things have always been done, and that's the exactly way will always be done going forward. And the reveal of why he thinks that later on, I I really enjoyed. But like, yeah, definitely, definitely, I love the way that like, even though I think he's kind of referred to as like first minister and high priest, relatively interchangeably in the book. I love the way that in our notes you refer to him consistently as first minister because that's like <laughs> you know that's the head of our suspended government yeah. technically i mean you just can't help think of like a an ian paisley or a peter robinson <laughs> and, and his whole cycle i mean kind of there's so there's other people that suffer around it so i'm thinking of dylan gurn uh -huh. the, the um, no no i'm thinking of the uh oh the, the Yes, the pyramid builders. Yes, so they um, haven't been paid for generations, uh, most of ever. their lives. <laughs> yeah. And they're just expected to go and build these enormous monuments. And you know, presumably they'll have their hands chopped off if they don't. or And if they don't do a good job, they'll get their hands chopped off. So you know, um, it's a little bit of a suspension of disbelief of how they keep existing working all days and you're know, feeding themselves on yeah on they set it up it doesn't make oh. any sense you're right but they, they, they the gag in the script or the gag in the book is that like building the pyramids for the royals is like a loss leader <laughs> that like because they're the royal pyramid builders like other people come to them to build like just a grave or whatever or like a, a tomb and like and that's somehow one is supposed to offset the other but obviously that's <laughs> it's not possible <laughs> Right, because yeah. they're spending all their time on, on yeah, because they're building these big ass pyramids all the time. Uh, yeah, I've got I've got time for the the tackles. I was um, something bubbled to the surface, like one of those old memories, you know, from the first time I read this. I was like, I don't think I got that two A, two B thing. When I was a kid, like I mean, we did Latin and we did classics at school, so like I knew what Roman numerals were, but like. Roman numerals with a letter beside them, like that that didn't compute for whatever reason. So I think I read them as like la and lab when I was first reading it. <laughs> I just like didn't get the joke at all. So yeah, I it was worth revisiting this book if only for that. Yeah, I, I just kept thinking how the clasps were like um um oh you know I at some point I was gonna make about austerity and um I mean, yes, I get that because he's trying to he's trying to set these guys up there like the, the 
they're the working class of of Jelly Baby, essentially, and yeah, they're in thrall, in thrall basically to the royal family, and I, which is I I find it interesting that you put it in the notes that like you don't hit them, but you're not taken with them. Whereas I thought that kind of class consciousness of it might might have endeared them to you a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of a twofold thing. So, I mean, um, like when we're recording, it's just like the the day after Boris Johnson sat in front of the inquiry and I was sat there with my popcorn and my cigars and that was, that was brilliant. Um, and I'm, um, yeah, so I, I totally with them on, um, on the, you know, the worker struggle and solidarity and all that. And actually, in, in, I, I, you know, I've said I didn't really enjoy part two so much. But in deconstructing it, I mean, the, the clusps and Dylan Gurn, their introductions here are actually, they're quite good. And I think yeah. this might even be where they're perhaps at their strongest in the story, which I'm, I'm not sure how that sits with me as, as sort of wanting to hit on part two. It I, definitely I really doesn't love, have but, enough drive. I mean, you're right, like the character introductions and stuff are good, but they're not really being driven anywhere at this point, these, right. these, these sets of characters. I thought more that you might get interested in the whole the timey wimeyness of this, where they start using time paradoxes to duplicate people. Yeah, I, thought that's I, like liked, way it, up your street, I liked it, but um, it didn't really go anywhere for me throughout the, yeah. the book. I suppose it gets railroaded by the um, the pyramids flaring up, to, uh, 2A getting flattened yeah. uh, by the, the timey wimey. There's a lot of really good talkie pieces where they're, they're discussing economics and um, how they're going to afford the pyramids, which leads them on a decision to turn to using magic. And I, I it was, yeah, it's kind of like Thoreau's Walden mixed in with um, some, insert your fantasy piece of choice here. Yeah. Um, and I'll filter through everybody's like primary school understanding of ancient Egypt as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, Dylan You're right, Gurn. actually, that, that doesn't go too far. I think it's elaborate and it's fun, but like we know that the pyramid's getting built regardless. So yeah, it doesn't have a big impact on the A on the A story, I guess, that stuff. So it is it's it is just a bit of fun that, that it actually eats up quite a lot of pages, ultimately, just to explain it. Yeah. Uh similarly for the embalmers, Dylan Gurner, they're a great double act. Yeah. Um they're they're a lot of fun to um to, to listen to but i don't really know where they well they they do they form a key key point later in the story um, yeah they do but we do again you're right i think we spend a, a disproportionately large amount of time with them just just noodling with these like similarly to the the time paradox people like all this kind of comedic exploration of embalming like an egyptian style of bombing where like eyeballs are getting put in jars and stuff like that and the fact that Tepic's ghost is there sorry Tepic's dad Tepicimon or Tepicimon or however we're saying that uh that his dad the ghost is having to watch all this and he's just, like super grumpy about it and hates everything like that it, it's quite funny but like again it doesn't like massively drive the story kind of kind of echoes of uh the king and weird sisters with with that although obviously um he, uh, the 27th is going on a on a, a different journey yeah it's a good point though actually i i hadn't really considered that i guess i should have done because we actually read them relatively close together this time around but there's uh, something in that we know that he obviously has this obsession with death and runs through the whole series and uh, and all that but like the fact that like ghosts are just like people with no bodies is quite funny <laughs> sometimes like you know they're not they're not like supernatural beings or like white sheets or whatever they're just like they're just people they just can't touch things and it really pisses them off it's it's, it's inconvenient for them uh I, I i do have a bit of a soft spot for that stuff i have to say i'm, I'm glad we're finding that well i'm finding that i'm warming to this book a bit more now that i'm talking about it yeah. um tepic and dios's relationship is has a Actually, quite a lot of the better stuff in this book. Um, yeah, you can feel the sort of the the heat of the conflict between them, and 
Um, really makes you feel for Tepic. Um, yeah. Dios is a bastard, man. Yeah, it's so relatable because it's like it's the old ways versus the new. Like we've all been there right. when we were kids, you know, raging, raging against our parents and raging against the way things are. But we, we, we know in our hearts they should be different. Except Tepic's like obviously right. <laughs> you know, he's not going to grow out of it in this instance. So, yeah, you're right. It's quite relatable, but I just don't think there's not like a super clear goal for this section. Whereas, like, the first section is he has to become an assassin, but then the ironic ending is that just as he becomes an assassin, he gets called home. Whereas it just feels like this isn't quite as cohesive. Tracy, or Patrice, as I was calling her. Um, it sounds like it's more like her, her MC name or something. Like <laughs> Patrice, yo. Uh, indeed. Uh, yeah. That's, I, so, like, if, if we can say Jelly Baby with a straight face, then we can have Tracy the concubine with a straight face as well. And you bastard the camel. You know, there's there's a lot of work here to be done to discuss these things without laughing. <laughs> uh, Tracy, Tracy was okay. Um, yeah, in terms yeah, of the female, well it's, it's a good time to check in with the old female representation, <laughs> which has been a little... I would hesitate to say it's been a rocky road, but it's it's been a gravel path, perhaps, up until now. I think, despite the obvious potential pitfalls in, like, having this character who's a concubine, I feel that, like, we spend a, a bit less time, like, overtly remarking on her body. Like, in any time that there's kind of sexual tension between Tepic and Tracy, it's like it's from it's inside Tepic. We're we're getting the perspective of inside Tepic's head. We're getting his reaction to it rather than like a description of it. A description. Yeah. Do you know? And I think that that feels like a subtle but a quite important distinction. And of course there's something else going on, which is Terry is trolling Star Wars. Which oh, I yeah. liked. Yes. Um, <laughs> With the old gold bikini. And it's it's very conscious. I think he knows exactly that. So I mean it is in this book that that Tracy is identified as Tepic's sister, but he yeah. doesn't know, they don't know that until the end yeah, of the book. Right. And it's it's so obviously a, a Star Wars troll. Yeah, there's definite Return of the Jedi vibes going on here. Because, um, I mean, and right enough, I mean, this would only be, what, five or six years since Jedi came out. Right. Yeah, so that makes sense. Yeah, it looms large. And it's lots It's lots of fun. As a result. Um, yeah, yeah, she's, um, she's not, as compelling as Weird Sisters, which I think are, are definitely the standout female characters so far. Yeah. Um, she's uh, certainly not as interesting as any of the main male characters, but the sort of the fiery female trope that she is channeling, I think is, is a lot more competent than we've seen from the other Discord characters to this point. Sure, yeah. I mean, even in terms of like the the female barbarians and and stuff like that, yeah, Tracy feels more well rounded. Like she's competent, as you said, and I think how things pay off for her. You know, the fact that she ends up in charge essentially. I think that's what makes it feel a lot more well rounded for me. The fact that we're not focusing on her appearance all the time, and that she does get a, a payoff of her own at the end, like her yeah. story. Yeah. So that yeah, it de definitely feels in a step and. A step in the right direction for me. Um, it's the last ten pages of this that really, like, soar all of a mm. sudden when we get um, we get the gods making landfall and just preceded um the introduction of you bastard, yeah, the greatest mathematician who's been trailed a while, and I kind of wish we'd seen him rather than trailed so much just up close because mm -hmm. um. Mm -hmm. Certainly my, yeah, my second or first favorite character in the book. Um, I can see that. I got I'm time not for sure it why, though. Yeah, it's why. an interesting one. I mean, there's just something, like, so insane about it. But, like, the way he describes it, it's just like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Obviously, the camel. Camels are thinking about maths all the time. I buy that. Yeah, uh, I, th I think it's that process that we get all the um, highfalutin mathematics down to the camel movement and action and and then the, the environment around him it's just yeah. one of those like original terry pratchett creations where it's so uniquely him i think we're like i could spitball ideas for set pieces or characters for a hundred years and i would never come up with like 
a camel who can do calculus. Like I would just never come up with that, you know. And the fact that he's quite he plays a role in this plot as well. It's not just something that he's kind of noodling with off to the side. Like he is a little bit with the the quantum stuff. You know, this you bastard has like a, a really significant role to play in the story. And uh, so yeah, <laughs> I'm with you on that. Like I I absolutely love him. I do also agree though that like those little teases of like oh you know down beneath the castle or down beneath the palace the greatest mathematician was pondering it's like he's playing a lot in this book with withholding information which isn't something he's done a lot in previous books so so yeah so that that's an example of that and one of the examples that maybe doesn't fully land but the reveal makes it worthwhile like once you once you get into the character like all is forgiven right so yeah, moving on to part three, I will give you a flavor of Andy's great synopsizing. Pages 215 to 306, the book of the new sun. Tepic meets philosophers of time and tortoises and joins them at a symposium in a Phoebe. His kingdom is destroyed by gods in their wrestle for the sun. Taklasp and 2A make plans to leave, unaware roads out lead in. Kumi Plots an uprising with the mob of priests as Dios fumbles for control. Under orders of Tepikaimon the 27th, reanimated, Dill and Karen break out the dead. Jelly Baby runs on past time, explains Thagonal, and its pyramids use up new time. Though his kingdom is time twisted, Tepic tells Tracy he is set upon a return. They are reunited with Chitter, he sees all sorts of tax incentives. After a night's drinking, Tepic leaps from the sailing ship, liberates you bastard, Fends off some helpful soldiers and reaches a crack in a rock face that will take him to Jelly Baby. And I just want to point out that he wrote Jelly Baby as Jelly Baby, like the sweets, for that last one. Just so that we don't forget. We've done a really good job so far. So, so there's a lot um, unpacking that, um, in that part. And it's such a, such a valuable experience that that is just like, just just putting down those, those plot beats and trying to create like a, a coherent thread through them is like it just it does really show you that like even though you don't you might feel bogged down in it like there is quite a lot going on and I, and the, the plot does reinvigorate itself here doesn't it like there's a lot more agency in this in this section would you agree mm -hmm. um i think this is still where the set pieces thing exists it is following a path but it's it's set together with we're talking about um so Python-esque gags at all sort of form a sequential line. I think the the philosopher's symposium is 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 one of those. It's um, I mean the the tortoise shooting takes a while takes a while to get over with, but um, there's a lot of a lot of good stuff. We've yeah, got a listening philosopher and um, the uh, they all go off on tangents. They'll talk over one another. Yeah, it's a huge piss take of philosophers and philosophy students and, and all that. I think why this works a bit better for me is because, like, from a story mechanics point of view, like, they're they're an obstacle. So, like, Tepic is there to, to get answers on all these, like, airbags, basically. All these, like, philosophers are getting in his way. So, so they service the plot a little bit better than, like, the quantum laborers do, I think. Um but I agree that they have two bites of the cherry and that the tortoise experiment and the symposium are kind of, it's the same, it's essentially the same plot mechanic, just twice. So yeah, it's a slight improvement, I think, over what came before in book two. And then you can know that again, he's like, he's doing his ancient Egypt thing. So like, you can kind of, you can almost feel the wheels turning here. Like, well, if ancient Egypt exists, then obviously ancient Greece has to exist so that they can interact with each other. <laughs> and it's in danger of like spiraling out of control and just like painting the whole of the ancient Mediterranean into the disc world. This is another large part of the book and Tepic actually doesn't really do an awful lot apart from get this explanation from Pythagonal. That, I mean, that's his, his main goal and achievement. Yeah. In this book, which is, is quite a good one that... Jelly Baby runs on past time and the pyramids use up the new time. Yeah. I love this. Slow and not moving forward and setting its ways. I did not understand the lick of this when I first read it. 
it's a really key it's a really key line not i you know I, I had to go back over it i remember hunting out that line because yeah it unlocks so much of the story yeah absolutely and that as i say like when i was a kid i just don't think i really got it but um on the reread i thought it, it was really well handled i think that that kind of world building with the pyramids and what their function is works pretty well you know when we were talking about he's experimenting with withholding information like that's a really big a really key piece of information to withhold and it works for me because you know the the exposition is it's kind of tr- trickled out so like we know and we know as much as we need to know for the story to make sense at any given moment so you, he a- avoids these big exposition dumps like for example in sorcery where he's just like explains everything about the mage wars and sorcerers and why I exist and why they shouldn't exist all at once pretty much right at the start you know that information about like why pyramids exist and what effect they have on the world like that's withheld until it becomes this crisis moment for uh, for Tepic he has to figure that out to advance the story so that's why that that works a lot better for me and because it's something that kind of storycraft is something I'm a little bit obsessed with I I forgive a lot in this book because I just love to see him experimenting with those um, kind of mechanics, you know. I think what what attracts me to that, I mean, it's a great explanation, but it, uh, the way it's um, communicated, it's 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 some beautiful writing, mm. and it's very there's not a lot of it in relation to that, but um, it's probably we could put it in favorite quotes section. Um, there is some stuff that's withheld that just created ambiguity for me. And so um, we I, I knew that um, Jelly Baby had read somewhere, um, somewhere else, but it wasn't quite clear to me that there was this crack in a rock that they could re-enter. It wasn't clear to me why the soldiers of sort and Phoebe were going to that place, which is because the place wasn't there. So it was essentially like new territory to fight over. Because they had a border, they felt that they had to dispute that border, I think is what, it, yeah, it's a bit thin. People sat in their ways liking to dispute things. <laughs> Yeah, so Imag- local. Imagine, imagine a bunch of old bastards disputing a border after thousands. Of years. <laughs> he, he could, he could picture that. I, I really liked um, the the stuff in Ankhmar Pork. Or sorry, the stuff in Jelly Baby around the gods making landfall. And I know we got quite a lot of it. I kind of wish it was more, where the the gods are fighting with one another and. You know, we, we, there's their buildings destroyed, but I would have liked to have seen more of that buildings destroyed, the actual surface level stuff. Yeah, it feels a bit like as you describe it in your synopsis and stuff, like there's there's gods wandering around making life difficult. They're basically these kaiju, <laughs> like you know, yeah. crocodile headed <laughs> monsters, like striding the landscape, but that is like. It's almost again weirdly straying back into the sorcery territory right, where like right. it's just it's too big. The idea is too big. Like you said, you need to kind of have some kind of ground level interpretation of it. Like how is this who's hoisted this god step on? That kind of way, like how looking at it from the perspective of the people. It all feels a bit big and a bit ephemeral, I guess. I, I think, I'm not sure from how far back, but I'm really keen to see more of the gods. I remember getting very excited when we saw the the ice giants. Yeah, yeah, that was, that was great. So, depending on how strict you're being, casting your eye over the the titles that are coming up, there's there's god stuff. We'll see some gods. God. Yes, I'm looking forward to. It. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've caught a glimpse of of gods in that. Um, the the priests' politics was was quite fun as a as side to that. You've got uh, Kumi really steps up here, yeah, and starts to become a character in his own right. And um, I, and I like that it's not um, that who, the the question of who's in control is something that sways back and forth. It looks like Kumi is going to take over. Yeah, because we 
start to get a sense here, the flip side of that, that what, what is allowing Kumi to kind of think that that might be possible is the fact that Dios is really starting to fray around the edges here. And we haven't quite had that explanation as to why that is. Again, it's something else that he's experimenting with withholding. So, yeah, so I thought that worked really well. And it's not something I don't think I would have been as interested in if if that reveal with Dios's past and stuff, if that if that wasn't so well handled. You know, if we knew all that information up front, I don't think this priest politics stuff would be interesting in this moment. Right, because it's not just... Um... And there's there's a line somewhere about um a god that you have believed in um coming to life it's kind of like the auditor showing up <laughs> yeah if you're a priest um, yeah <laughs> but it's not just you know uh, any any old priest this is the priest that from millennia has channeled or has has rep claimed to represent the gods and yeah now they're so now, the now they're all um now exactly. they're all visiting and um yeah so he must be really freaked out he must be crawling the walls like a, a nicotine addict um a week without a fix yeah his his attitude to it is interesting because i remember there's a bit where like the gods have come and he's like super annoyed that they won't obey him and at the time it just it sort of makes sense the way he justified it makes sense because he's the high priest as far as he's concerned he decides how the gods should act because he's essentially responsible for the people believing in them and then once we it turns out that he's like the first ever high priest it's like he actually created these gods and now they're like wandering around knocking over temples and like fucking with the sun and stuff and he's like pissed off about it because he made them and now they're out of his control so yeah again without giving too much away you know that that's a seed that's been planted now in this world that is going to, you know, have some green shoots. Okay. If we want to to draw analogies with what, what we now call Christian or Dewey Smith, I mean, if these are the gods and um, I don't know, it's almost like Deus is, is like Satan. He has, is, is facing the, he is the epicenter of the judgment, I guess is where I'm going with this. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah. It's all, it's cause yeah, I guess for us in the West, it's, it's hard to get away from those kind of fables. And that's almost, <laughs> it's part of the point of this book. It's one of the themes, isn't it? That you're shackled to tradition, regardless of what you do. I, yeah, I mean, I feel bad. Like I wish I'd had time to kind of immerse myself a little bit more in the actual Egyptian history here, you know, the, you know, I know there are some specific references from Kuft and, and Khufu, who I think built the Pyramid of Giza, but like beyond that, I'm sure there are many, many more specific references here that are just like miles above my head, you know. Are there any characters we should be looking at here? I mean, Tepa Simon, 27th, really. He comes um, back to life, yeah, I mean, he gets back. his body back, yeah. And I, I, this is where he is kind of, he's kind of Discworld's first zombie. He's picking bits of himself out of jars and joining yeah. himself together again. And he's the first, he's the first zombie that we meet. Yeah. Oh. I'll just, I'll say, I'll say that much. Uh, yeah, and so, so that and all the other ancestors and like the way that that's handled and like the culture gap between the mummies. <laughs> And like, and that it's he is, fun. he's playing on the horror tropes of like mummies as horror villains, but like, they're also just like, all they're just really annoyed old people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Obvious jokes can be the best ones. Yeah. And especially when you take them, take them to their logical extremes in the way that Terry does so well. Uh, yeah. That whole, that whole bit with them, yeah. Going back through this waking up all the old, all the old mummies and how they all differ from each other. I thought was really well handled. It's that it's a blending of the, the the cosmic and the supernatural with the the sort of the kitchen sink or bed sit banality that yeah. that just uh, time and time again he rewards us with. Um, it's it's amazing how much he he has milked out of that so far. Oh, that absolutely, really hit the target. But it's interesting that you you even does. your your cultural. I think there's a there is a slight cultural disconnect here because like you're. Your touchstone there was that oh yeah he's the disc world's first zombie but like in as terry writes this and terry's generation i guess are thinking of like mummies are like they're they're this distinct separate pop cultural entity you know and they have their own kind of tropes and rules 
Uh, and I think he like has a really nice liberal sprinkling of those in this um, in this section with all the ancestors. I think it's really fun. Right. We do have so we we've, we've got a museum here in Belfast which has a sarcophagus in it. That there's right? a there's a mummy in this there's a mummy, mummy like, is that yeah a... we have a mummy in the Ulster Museum yeah I couldn't tell you who it is I think it's a woman though yeah yeah you're right um I'm, I haven't been there for a while I mean my sort of yeah I I didn't I sh that would have been interesting to do some reading around this <laughs> I mean my my impression of mummies is Scooby Doo basically well yeah toilet roll and and chasing people along dark corridors and. And that's what this section is leaning into, isn't it? A little bit. It's the Scooby Doo mummies, like that's the old Universal uh, monster movie mummy. Yeah. Right. What else is going on? Uh, in the priests throwing one another over the river. Um, <laughs> that's that's <fun>. Priests for <laughs> you, really, isn't it? <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> um, this actually brings up just why the river de gel or gel has come up. Um, this brings up an ambiguity withheld in the book that I still don't fully get or get if I get that Dios is crossing the river every single night and this mystery has been built up around us and then we see the priests all cross the river and I'm not really sure what the answer is. So my understanding is Dios has to cross the river to go back to his pyramid because the way that pyramids were built originally was that the chamber, the, the burial chamber, does essentially stop time. So if he wants to... Recharge? Yeah, I guess. Which, now that I say it out loud, maybe it doesn't make sense. But that, that seems to certainly be what's implied in the story, is that he has to... If he doesn't want to grow old and die, he has to return to his pyramid to recharge, essentially, as you right. say. Right, yes. Because he would, he would go over every night, so presumably he would sleep there and just get his Duracell uh, moments. I guess so. I, I guess that's something I've missed in trying to sort of ascertain the, the geography, because I had assumed that the pyramids were maybe just sort of built a bit everywhere, maybe on this side of the bank. I think it's mentioned a few times that like the city of the dead occupies one side of the river and then like the actual city is the other side. But because we don't we don't spend that much time in the city of the dead until this section, you don't really have any reason to have that picture in your head. It's just, it's mentioned in passing, but like it's never really acted upon until now. So no, I get it. Like it, yeah, and like I've never been to Egypt or anything. I don't know how like based on real archaeology or real geography this is. So I just kind of just going with it, I guess. <laughs> anything else you want to bring up before we move on to book? Four? It's the return of chitters, isn't it? Because that that yeah, made me return of chitters, yes. That made me quite happy just because it seemed absolutely insane not to pay off anything from the first section of the book. I was like, at least chitters comes back because I'd forgotten. I think um my memory of this section was a little bit blurry. I was more focused on yeah, like the mummies and stuff. So yeah, so I thought at least even if we're not going to meet the whole gang again, at least chitters comes back and at least he has an active role to play in in the back end of the story and like you know all that stuff that we liked about the assassins guild like he kind of embodies that you know he's got the kind of charm and he's like a bit of a rogue and he's essentially i mean to use your star wars kind of um metaphor like he's han solo yeah, isn't so. he <laughs> you know so yeah so it was great to see him back from just because he's an enjoyable character but yeah just so that my story structure brain doesn't get too itchy and his relationship with Tracy, you know, again, very Han Solo-esque, so. And Alphonse with his um, unusual tattoos. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. yeah. Uh, and again, you know, uh, just just to do to check in with our yeah, female representation and how that's going, like that, uh, yeah, that the gruff, the gruff world weary sailor with all the explicit tattoos, like he's the one who gets embarrassed about it. You know, he's the one who's on the back foot because he's got all these explicit tattoos. That that also feels like a step in the right direction. And it's funny. So it's a win-win. Would you like to also read the book of 101 Things a Boy Can Do? Yeah, go on. It's only fair. Okay. Uh, yeah, page 
308 to 380, the book of 101 things a boy can do. Phoebe and Zort prepare for war where Jelly Baby used to be, and Tepic answers the Sphinx's riddle. At his palace, he finds the priests have crossed the river to get to the other side. Dios finds himself amid the assembled monarchy zombies who are comparing notes. They help Tepic climb and destroy the Great Pyramid, which sends a time blast through the kingdom. When Chitters returns with Tracy and Tepic abdicates, leaving her as the new and improved king. Architects become engineers and embalmers become chefs. Dios awakens at the beginning and restarts his life cycle as advisor in ancient Jelly Baby. I kind of like the ending, actually, for all, for all the kind of, I hesitate to say bloat, but like, it's not a fast paced journey, as we've alluded to, but like, I, I like this ending. Yeah, um, there's, again, there's a lot of really good set pieces in it that um, I think probably joined together better than than in the rest of the book, apart from book one. Um the I'm thinking particularly of the mummies making their own external pyramid so that Tepic can get yeah, that was cool. top of his. Um, oh, we were talking, it might have been in the last book, but we had to, the priests doing like sports commentary on the God, God battle. Um, <laughs> we've got, oh, the Sphinx's riddle, which is actually Tepic's riddle, um, deconstructing. So there's that whole... Um, yeah, almost like pushing himself as a, a riddle consultant upon Yeah. The, and the that's the that's something. the assassin training right there, isn't it? Like that's the kind of it's almost like granny with like headology, you know. Yes. And how could we how could we have an ancient Egyptian story without a Sphinx? So I thought that was handled really well. I, I enjoyed that a lot, I have to say. And yeah, where where it ends up you know, the stuff that the stuff that comes up here again in terms of glimpses of things that i see in this book that i know are going to come back like the, the, that little moment between the two sergeants at the border was just like ah, we're gonna have to kill each other such an inconvenience <laughs> like it's not yeah. what i wanted to do when i woke up this morning i know i'm a soldier but like come on you know this is a bit much even um, though i didn't get how it fitted in that was a nice little moment yeah okay. yeah and again, like there are, you're right in that there are maybe several divergences, several asides, too many, too many in this book. But like, I, I think he, again, like I'm just pausing so I don't give too much away. But those kind of glimpses into like working class life in this setting, um, the we've had the embalmers, we've had the the construction guys, and then we get this this little glimpse at the soldiers, like. You know, these are things that are going to come back and these are things that he's going to develop and, and improve on. And these are the kind of elements that make this world feel like this world to me a little bit. So, yeah, I like that little section. I think um, I think I'm happy with the sort of the way those elements can come together in the the big um, race to the, the Great Pyramid. So you've got the embalmers in with um the the royals um and you've got the um the architect somewhere in amongst that i'm not actually i'm not quite sure how it all fits together it's not as them. clear yeah it's a good no. point because because you're like yes i mean the embalmers have kind of they've driven the narrative because they've helped the 27th wake up all the other ancestors and then the ancestors help tepic get to the top and cap and then you've got the, the priests come in there's a showdown with dios yeah. i guess i guess i guess the pyramid on. builders the pyramid builders have the knowledge that tepic needs to cap the pyramid i guess that's their contribution to the finale it's not like super proactive but it's it's there yeah. i suppose yeah um so but yeah i i agree with you that it's not it, it could be a lot more dynamic for sure I and mean, I, I did really dig the sort of the kind of a uh, lowbrow basics of of Tepic scaling the pyramid. Um, there's a time for lowbrow basics entertainment. Uh, oh, totally. Good, great, good gripping suspense, James Bond sort of stuff. Yeah, because it does. It has a bit of you know, it's it, it, it is Indiana Jones. 
Yeah, and it's that. It's like it's Star Wars. It's it's Indiana Jones. It's Lawrence of Arabia. It's like it's a desert adventure. So yeah, there, there has to be a bit of that, and we know Terry can do that, and we we've seen that before. And despite all these new sort of techniques, he's trying. Like he's he's still got a good eye for a, a set piece finale. As the the finale comes about, there's there's a real sort of. Um... A cyclical thing like um I, i'm sure it's this type of story trope uh the one that's coming to my mind is the end of babylon 5 where new character old characters are replaced by new characters in same roles or there's that cycle thing where uh i've got it here in my description architects become engineers and embalmers become chefs yeah um and you've got tracy takes over um and of course the the, the big one is dios's return to the beginning um, which makes this whole story a kind of um, one of those Doctor Who things like a is a bootstrap paradox that's the only one I can remember that sounds impressive I was, I'm surprised that you didn't go for the Red Dwarf reference oh which one's that it's because isn't oh Rob or Ross yeah yes. or Rob or Rob or Ross <laughs> <laughs> there's a good fun under the pool table with the the Ouroboros written on the on the box that I'm not even going to attempt to explain that entire reference if you want to google it <laughs> and look up how how Lister is is born or is found in in Red Dwarf if you know you know move on <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of it though isn't it I mean like there's big themes and stuff and that yeah. whole cyclical that that idea that like it's almost a punishment, I guess, isn't it, for Dios? Like, he wants to rest, he's fed up, and then just when he's, like, ruined everything so badly that, like, he he's a chance to, like, just wash his hands of it all, let Tepic take over, he ends up right back at the start, and he's got to go through all these thousands of years all over again. He's a workaholic, isn't he? It's his choice. His really? choice is to punish himself by yeah. doing these things that are punishing that's true. I mean, I guess when he goes back in time, he doesn't have to become the high priest again. But you're right; it's in his nature. He can't do anything else, and then that's almost the tragedy of it, I suppose. And while we're talking about Dios being in the past, uh, the dynamic between Dios and Kift, uh, I liked a lot, and I thought that you know that those little breadcrumbs paid off well. And the fact that Kift was this scoundrel, and that. All, all the traditions, all the myths are essentially wrong and that the kingdom was founded by a thief. You know, that's what brings those themes of power and tradition kind of together to a head, like right at the end. And that's why it feels quite satisfying, I think. It's like I said earlier, like that, that's the kind of the demonstration that tradition is a powerful tool, essentially, in the hands of scoundrels. And <laughs> thinking about something Boris Johnson said yesterday, you know, in this country, it's customary to say goodbye to someone with a toast. Like that's his excuse for partying during COVID. Is tradition. He's trying to lean on tradition to to save his own skin. So, yeah, I think that's that's part of why that that ending, despite the rocky road towards it, feels um, feels really satisfying. Oh yeah, I'm just gonna keep reading my notes. <laughs> I find what I find what I wanted to say originally. Uh, so initially, it was quite hard for me to put my finger on like what wasn't working in this, but yeah, like I've been kind of alluding to all along, like it, in terms of the ideas of play and the story craft, this does feel a lot more Discworld. In a way that maybe only like Mort and Weird Sisters have kind of touched on so far, but the kind of revelation I had just as I was getting to this point of the story was that this seems to me to be the rare example of good story craft that's kind of let down by a weak concept whereas usually the opposite is much more common you know you've got really somebody will come up with a really good concept and their execution of it will be poor yeah like Ter terry's execution here is really really good but for the most part but just that high concept just this like ancient egyptian riff doesn't fit as well into like the overall picture of this world as something like death or something like you know the, the weird sisters in the ram tops this feels separate in a way i'd be interested how you feel about that as somebody who's reading this for the first time like does this feel does jelly baby feel like it inhabits the same disc 
as Granny and Nanny and Magrat in the Ram Tops? Um, I don't know if it's too early for me to say. Mm. I, I I think I'd probably have to err on the side of yes. Okay, um, that's interesting. If if we're talking about you know a world a whole, yeah. Um, and I, I kind of little twenty second spoiler. So I know that this is a completely isolated story, and that that we aren't seeing these characters again, or we'll get references. And I'm kind of sad about that. I like oh, okay. To a few characters and I would like to see the place return to. Yeah, that's fair. And that's interesting, actually, because I thought for sure, having sort of browsed your notes and and the kind of criticisms you had, I thought you might have felt that this did feel a bit more standalone. And obviously I did spoil that for you by telling you that it was kind of a one and done kind of story. But like, yeah, just that kind of world of like, of rinse wind, of granny, of death. I feel that like, because this is such an obvious such a clear pastiche of ancient Egypt, it just feels a little bit different. It feels like it doesn't have the same kind of one fit in the fantasy world because it's such a clear historical reference. But obviously enough spooky stuff goes on and there's enough mummies wandering around. There's enough timey-wimey stuff maybe yeah. to paper over the edges. So yeah, maybe I'm being a bit harsh there. It does cover a fair amount of similar ground to sorcery. Yeah, and I think I just think sorcery is a much better executed book. Interesting. Yeah, I would I would have loved to have seen some of the craft on display here, in terms of like how he deploys information and how he uses twists and stuff. I would have loved to have seen a bit of that craft applied to the story of sorcery. Should we deliver our favorite quotes now? Absolutely. Go for it. Do I go first? Um. Yes. So. <laughs> There's just so much in this one. Yeah, go on. The other legend, not normally recounted by citizens of Ankhmer Park, is that at an even earlier time, a group of wise men survived a flood sent by the gods by building a huge boat. And on this boat, they took two of every type of animal then existing on the disc. After some weeks, the combined manure was beginning to weigh the boat low in the water. So... The story runs. They tipped it over the side and called it Ankhmore Park. It's great. It's not where you think that story's going at the start, is it? <laughs> <A little> bit. <laughs> Fantastic. I, I, it's something that I saw discussed on the subreddit quite recently about how every time he describes, like, basically the slums of Ankhmore Park, like what a cesspool it is, or like how gross the river is, like, like that comes up at least once in every book in some books multiple times but it's never the same like how you, like this it's like it, it's it's noah's ark but it's like actually about a massive pile of shit that gets launched like the, those descriptions of agmore park are just mind-boggling just only because there's so many of them and they're each completely fresh that's so that, a, that's a great quote that's the second part of a footnote i think the first part's pretty good as well um and if the footnotes are great in this book yeah and really more, they're coming thicker and faster now too aren't they? Uh, so you've got another quote do you want to do your other one or well, we've, got, we'll, we'll do, we've both got two we'll so we'll do, turns, do yeah. one each I'll do, my, I'll do my longer one first then so so much for time flowing past he thought glumly I might do that everywhere else but not here here it just piles up like snow so what I like about that is that it's, it's a relatively early kind of part of Tepic's internal dialogue after he returns back to the kingdom. And what I really like about it is that what we assume is metaphor is later revealed to be literal. So like time is literally piling up in the kingdom. And it's a simple trick. Uh, it's one that Terry uses quite well. And I think he, he reuses later in other books. So yeah, that, that kind of stuck with me. Like when I was browsing the list of quotes, I was like, oh yeah, like that. He's given away the twist and that and, and for a good twist to work for a good twist to work it has to seem obvious in retrospect and like little lines like that little what we assume are metaphors that turn out to be true like that's how you do that like that's the building blocks of a good twist so i just i, I noticed that and it's part of that thing i've been banging on about for the whole episode about the the story craft on display and that's that's just like a perfect example of it 
and I notice you've been veering towards selecting those type of quotes. Um, and it's they're not always the, the, the most uproariously funny, sometimes they're quite beautiful, they're often quite modest or subtle. Yeah, I mean, I think I've. I... I mean, we all know, I think, that he he writes great jokes and we all know that the stories are loads of fun. I think for me, because I'm revisiting the books, like I'm looking for the, these are the things that are standing out to me on rereads, you know. Well, that's, that's kind of influenced me in my, my second quote, mm -hmm. um, particularly in the last days of the British Conservative Party empire, <laughs> that's <right>. um, particularly <laughs> opt. Tepic realised that the high priest was indeed truly mad. It was a rare kind of madness caused by being yourself for so long that habits of sanity have etched themselves into the brain. <laughs> yeah, I think it's an interesting one how, he, how he's decided to characterise Dios as this like thousands of year old character. Uh, yeah, just like the seemingly thousand year old reign of the, the British Conservative Party. Stop clock has to be right twice a day. Oh, exactly. Yeah, about that that idea that there are so that isn't there. There's bits where t where Dios's um, routine has been disrupted because like the apocalypse is happening, but because he said the same prayers at the same time every day. When that time comes, he literally can't do anything else, even though he, like, the world's ending all around him, but like. All he can think about is like the incantation of the third hour or whatever it is. And you're just like thinking about like what the minutiae of like just literally being alive for 1300 years or something like that. Like, like Terry thinks about that in a way that I think nobody else would. And like stuff like that, those little moments of existential horror that we see every now and again, like when you no know, witches can lose their minds when they take over animals, like that, that little little glimpse of it there in Dios. I love that. Uh, I'm really glad you pointed that out actually, because I forgot to mention it. So my second quote is also <laughs> a little bit dark as well under the current circumstances. But this is one that I, I picked because I, I do genuinely remember it sticking with me the first time around. So it's not that he had anything against belief. People needed to believe in gods, if only because it was so hard to believe in people. And I mean, it feels a little bit like I'm I'm 14 and this is deep or whatever, but like I was 14 or 13 or whatever when I first read it. And I, it did kind of strike me that like, yeah, maybe, sh you know, that explains a lot about especially our world where we live. It's like, yeah, that that explains a lot. Um, What about the post box? Is the post box? Post box. OK, we should probably have a theme tune for the post box. Um, but I well, can we afford one? Can we afford one? You're. Patreon stretch to that. <laughs> you got his phone Let's see. He's, th he's threatening to ask me. Something. Ask me um, in a month's time at yeah. uh, patreon.com forward slash yeah. Andy Luke. Um, I promised PJ I would. I had some possibly exciting news. We're doing really well on the oh, yeah. on the stats. Thank you so much. I added my notes to thank you earlier for spreading the word for enjoying this podcast. Um. Wow, we're now into 1,571 plays overall. Oh my goodness, fantastic. And today, as we record this, we just hit for our episode one, The Colour of Magic, 500. Lists. Oh wow, so that's awesome. So thank you all so much. Um, this really warms me up. Uh, yeah, that's exciting. I'm so glad you're enjoying what we're doing here to, to keep coming back. And I really love the letters too. We don't get so many. Um, but we've got one today from Roasty Buns. Oh, yes. From Roasty Buns on Twitter. Thank you guys for reading another one of my questions on the podcast in episode five. Glad to have your answers. It's one of my favorite questions to ask people. That was a good one, I have to say. I enjoyed that. But now for another one. Although it may prove political or controversial. Dun, dun, dun. If you'd rather not get into it, let me know. I'll think of a lighter question. It's too late. I'm already halfway through, so we're in. Terry Pratchett seemed, from what I've read, to be a genuine and humanist man with progressive ideals. And it got me thinking about authors and directors who are not that at all. What is your stance on separating the art from the artist? Can it be done? What's the cutoff point? I'm a big fan of horror, but can't bring myself to watch Jeepers Creepers or the classic Rosemary's Baby, as the directors of such films have disgusted me in such a way I physically cannot ignore it and just enjoy the movies as a piece of media. I'm also from Liverpool, 
I'm very left wing. And as a result, could find myself writing off movies or books made by right wing people, even if it's not evident in the book. Well, short, short of doxing yourself there by revealing your location, uh, Roasty Buns, uh, it's a very meaty question. I, I know my answer, but the reason I wanted to read the question out is so that I could make Andy answer it first. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm a confrontational figure at times, and I'm I'm quite on the left. It's fair to say as well. So I mean, uh, the the biggest one in my orbit has been Morrissey, who has just been dropping hints for the last thirty plus years that he's a massive piece of shit. Um, Fair. and I, I mean, I I, I never fell under the spell of J.K. Rowling to never bother with the Harry Potter books. Yes. Yeah, um, but Graham Linehan was was certainly on my radar as a writer. And you know what? I I I fuck him. I can't be around the art of artists that have proved themselves as horrible beings. Um and never by the sun. Um, okay. It's it's really disappointing when you know people in our hearts go to the turn out to be going to the really, really just dark places um of of hatred and um exclusion and there's so many great artists in this world that are undiscovered and i'd, I'd much rather people give them their time and their money like me and pj for example were really nice people exactly yeah um again thank you for the high stuff <laughs> keep yeah. it up um Nah, I couldn't agree more, man. Life's too short to give money to Nazis. Like, do you know what I mean? I mean, there's there's so many great people out there who are genuinely nice and good at what they do. I guess I am sympathetic to, like, I guess especially Harry Potter fans, like, because I, I know that that series meant a lot to people. And then, you know, that, that, that that's, and it was out there in the world for so long. And then one day, like, J.K. Rowling just woke up and chose violence. Like she just thought, like nobody saw that coming. So I guess if something like that series meant so much to you, it must be hard to separate it from the other. And I do sympathize with that. But I think you can draw a line under these things like that. Harry Potter meant so much to you at a certain period of your life, but like you can draw a line under that shit. Like you don't have to make that fandom your identity. You can go and find something else that you enjoy equally as much and then spend some money over there and, and, and make some new memories like, you know. And I, I think there, this is a really great question, by the way, I think there are, you, one way of looking at it is in terms of chrono, chronology. So when Rowling and Linehan were making the works that they're best known for, they weren't expressing those opinions. Yeah, there true. might have been there might have been a time early in Linehan's hating or Ryan's hating, where if they just uh, shut the hell up about that subject and carried on making good art instead of expending energy on hating people, that some of those audiences they turned away would have come back to them. I think that's actually a really good way of looking at it. I hadn't given this much thought because my knee-jerk reaction was, yeah, basically, fuck him, you know? But, yeah, it's a good point. And, like, I'm obviously a huge Father Ted fan and I, IT Crowd fan as well. But, like, it's one thing. Like, I've got my happy memories of of, of those series or whatever, but, like, I'm not going to go out of my way to continue to support this guy, like, just because he made something that I liked 30 years ago, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. That looking at it chronologically, that's a really good way of doing it. I think, Andy. The the person that made uh, Rosemary's Baby was he like a sec a child sex offender or something like that? Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. Because I'm so I imagine, like, if that person is doing something like that while they're making the art and in, in around the same time frame, it's much more difficult. I know. Um, I'm a massive fan of the thick of it. Mm -hmm. but, so watching the first two seasons with the actor who had a child porn collection oh, is yeah. really difficult. Yes. Um, Gosh, I'd forgotten about that. Because his, his performance is good. It's very, his lines are very much within the thick of its style. Yeah. So, it, yeah, it is difficult. And I, I, I think, actually, you know what? It probably should be. It um, 
if it's not difficult, then you're not paying attention. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, interesting. Um, Rosemary's finding it difficult is part of the healing. Yeah, that's a good point as well. Yeah. It's interesting what I was saying about yeah, what you can let go or what you can't, and Rosemary's Baby as an example. Like, it's not it's like a movie that I know, like, objectively is a good movie, but like, of Polanski's work, like Chinatown, I guess, would have had like quite a profound effect on me when I was a film student and I learned a lot from it. But like, I'm not going to sit down on Saturday night and like crack up at a beer and watch Chinatown, <laughs> you know, as, a, as basically as a result of Polanski being who he is, being a monster. Like, so I, I yeah. didn't know Polanski watched Chinatown. I remember I had this script book for Chinatown, I was quite young, I haven't seen it yet. So I'm wondering now. Now, you know what? I think this probably, I'm just going to make the decision for myself. I'm not watching Chinatown. I've got a massive bookshelf here. I've got a stack of DVDs. I'm too much to get through. Yeah, so. I mean, if it makes you feel better, he, he didn't write it. Robert Tyne wrote it. So read, feel free to read the script. <laughs> don't I watch see. the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, by all means, um, all right. Yeah, you all know, right. I think that is a good final arbiter and it's very thematically on point. Yeah, it's enough time. Yeah, that is good. Oh, well done. Tied it together very nicely there. Um, so very briefly, I just wanted to ask PJ if he had anything to plug. Actually, you go first. Okay, yeah. So for listeners in the UK, if you find yourself on the BBC iPlayer, you might be aware that the Oscar winning short film, An Irish Goodbye, is should still be available by the time this episode goes out. And a close collaborator of mine, Owen Cleland's, is James Martin, the actor with Down Syndrome's acting coach. He also wrote and directed a TV movie called Ups and Downs, which James starred in and which I script edited and which I have a cameo in. Oh, so you should definitely get on iPlayer, look up Ups and Downs and, and An Irish Goodbye if it's still there and you should watch those. They're both absolutely delightful, uh, really fun, really heartwarming um, pieces of TV drama. And um, yeah, I've heard an awful lot of chatter about an Irish goodbye. Uh, when I pick up an Oscar, did it? It or... did, yeah. Oscar winning, BAFTA winning. So it'll be up there as of today, at least for another few weeks, maybe longer. So definitely check it out. Check out Ups and Downs as well. Some super TV time. Um, be great. Um, this is my novel, Occupied. It's the story of um, the Occupy movement in Belfast, and it's a fiction. Um, about a group of campers out on a, a tent-based protest for about 80 days. Um, I worked on this book like across a decade. It's a big, big book. There's a lot to it. I did an awful lot of research, blend it with a lot of really um, gag writing, a lot of character work. Um, I'm... It's, it's not perfect, but I think it's as close to Perfect as a as a, a novel I've written myself, and I'd really like a, a few people to um to go and read it. It's quite cheap on if you're doing the Kindle, but I recommend the print. So Occupied by Andy Luke. As I said, you can you can find us all across the internet. Um, but our main hosting page is anchor.fm forward slash I've never read Discworld. And if you if you go by there, you can find links to us all over. Um, on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and all the different podcast hosts. Um, tell your friends. Tell your friends, yes. So, have I ever read Discworld? I want, oh, I, do you know what I'm interested in, actually? What percentage of Discworld have you now read? <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I, you know, I have been wondering that. I'm not going to... I mean, I'm sitting, we're sitting, I'm sitting in front of a computer. Well, there's going to be like decimal points and numbers after that, whatever way. So we... 42 books, is that right? Something like that. 40. I think that was 41. No, oh, well, I don't. Well, 42 gives us a nice round number. So you're okay, yeah. a sixth of the way through to squirrel. <laughs> no. Yeah. I feel like we've gone pretty far off the rails now. I don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to blow our own steers. Indeed. Right. Okay. See you Bye -bye. next time. Till next time. Ta-ra.